Folks, I wish you would stay with me to the end of this video, because I, I do have a point, but I have to go step at a time and say it in my words. Uh, possibly spent cores. You know, tools that have sliced all off of them. They're all hard stone, very hard, solid for hard hammering. These are uh, sort of sliced up to the round shape of uh, of uh, cortex, soft, just for some sort of soft pounding. Now. These are patterns that appear on, and this is how I put this puzzle back together. And I'm going to try to show you the pu pu puzzle pieces. These are patterns that are, shows up on all sizes of stone. I mean, they show up on all kinds of tools, and they are made from all sizes of stone, small and large. So the same technique of splitting up that stone was used on large stones and pebbles. Now, I have to change the top of this table to get to the next display. I realize that uh, this method of making stone tools, uh, I can prove it here in southwest Missouri, but there was a lot of different kind of rock, different places, so I'm just talking about, well, <laughs> top of this 10 acre hill. Well, these folks found a stone, and uh, I know it's easy to say uh, they found this rock and they wanted to carve off all this cortex so they can get down to the hard stuff. Well, yeah, that's easy to say. But I don't think that's what they said. They used every piece of that rock. All of these cortex that are uh, sliced off of stones are a tool. Every stone that I'm showing in my video today is a tool. Um, anyway, but when they do get to this hard stuff, they made uniface tools. Now, it seems like uniface tools have been around much longer than uh, the other name, by flaking or whatever. Uh, so... Uh, I really haven't seen many videos explaining how uniface tools were made, and I'm going to attempt it today. Uh, like I said, every every stone that I'm showing in this video today is a tool. Another consistent pattern uh, found made from large and small stones. These are the stones that I most likely, I mean, more often, find the uh, standing bird images. So the raw stone is uh, uh, is worked up, and it ends up being uh, the core. These possibly could be used up cores. Or they could be just saved for later. Because lots of interface tools can come from them.
I really got kind of ahead of myself here. I need to go back to working up that big rock. Uh, all stones will look different, of course. This is not the perfect example, but this is just the perfect example. Uh, an end piece is knocked off. And sometimes these end pieces are called turtles. They usually have a little bit of cortex on one side. Not always, but they're turned into really nice little tools. And then the stone is set up so that uh, uh, possibly this is where some of the cortex is being sliced off. There's uh, heavy packing, pretty deep divots, and then sanding to prepare the stone to be split. Now this makes this look like uh, the platter in the center is real thick. And sometimes I found that they have have platters that are real thick. And I've also found platters on both large stones and small that are as thin as a quarter inch. Um, but that piece in the middle, if you take it out and lay it down sideways, I call it a platter. The first two breaks are down there at the bottom. It appears like that on every tool I've got. looks like that. And I can see now that it sets up the stone for easier uh, splitting. But those two pieces right down there, I can show several that have been used as sanding. Uh, they're wedge-shaped stones. And they're the ones that make deep groove in the, in the splitting process. Uh, but right now I'm going to pause and talk about the heart stone. That part down there that I've called the heart stone because many times it looks like a heart. These sort of look like a heart, but these are those triangular shapes that come from the bottom of a platter. And uh, many times the finished product will look like a heart. I got several of them. Some little bitty. They're real special. <laughs> they have little bitty hearts. Some are larger. And some are actually uh, the final like core or something. But it is the heart of that uh, platter. Or, or the stone, like I said, uh, uh, a platter doesn't have to be real thin. Um, but these heart shapes are really fascinating. Let me show you another one. This one. It just looks like possibly a spent core. Of course, it's been used now as a hammer. And uh, actually, it's also a, a cleaver. But it just has a look of a heart. I don't know. That's why I call them heart stones. Okay. Now, let me take another path. This one's kind of cool. This stone has been turned into a nutting stone. And it's got this really awesome little bird right there. Actually, went over here too. That's cool. Um, this is one of my prize pieces. This is almost half of a um, a, a, lar a platter from a larger stone. There's a piece missing from here, and then it's only half. It's been split. The platter. Uh, I prized that one. That's neat. Now this stone sits right there. 
is what I want to talk about. This has all the characteristics, I mean the size and shape of a hand axe. And uh, that is where I believe the hand axe comes from stones. So let's talk about hand axes. It's the shape of the stone and how it came from the platter which a good flint knapper could turn into a hand axe. Maybe a small one. <laughs> Now this piece actually could have came from another place on a ladder. But we'll get back to the hand axe. I just want to show them a minute here that these, when they slice off cortex to start making the type of, uh, well, taking the cortex off so you have the hard part of the stone to work with. They saved every part. They were not raised in a generation of waste. But this is a abrasion tool that has some cortex on this side, a crescent-shaped abrasion tool. And on this side, on this part of the hard stone, was a crescent-shaped cutting tool. So this tool has both abrasion and cutting on the same tool. I've showed a few of these before, but this is just a, a collection of cortex that are a um, crescent-shaped abrasion tools. And these are from more internal on the stone, I guess, because these are all hard stone and they're crescent-shaped uh, cutting tools. All of these large and small. Cutting edges. Hard stone, crescent shaped cutting. Soft stone, crescent shaped abrasion. Now, this type of stone that comes from, I mean, size of stone, I don't know how to do this. Let me do it different. See the shape of the stone? That's the same shape of that stone. Teardrop shape. And I find this interesting. Because that stone has sort of an image like that. This stone... There's bird carvings on the other side of it. This stone has bird carvings on the other side of it. This stone sort of looks like that in a way. Like it came from the same place on a platter. And on this one has bird carvings on the other side of it and other stuff I found in there but as odd as that stone is with all that carving on it it is a common pattern that comes from the process of splitting up a platter now the splitting I'll be back in a minute also, square shapes are common. They make great little sanding tools. But splitting the stone, they have to make some pretty heavy divots. And uh, then with a sanding tool, they sand back and forth in here and make a groove down into it so then it could be split. 
Now to make these divots, they use hard stone. Each one of these shows a percussion bang bang. And these are all pieces of hard stone. And they have the appearance of being used to make heavy duty crushing. Now this one sort of looks like it might have also been used to do some of the sanding on there. Bang, bang, bang. And they show the percussion wear. Not a sanding wear, but a, well, that's kind of a sanding percussion on that end. So this could be a, whoops, <laughs> it didn't break. I'll get it. Artstone percussion tools. All of these. So there's the stones and there's a process. I just need one other proof. I just need the smoking gun to go along with my theory. And we'll go to the pottery shop and I will show it to you. Folks, you don't have to be a brainstorm to uh, lay a few rocks together and realize that there was some splitting going on. Folks, from my research, I understand that the uh, hand axe was discovered in around 1930, and then uh, someone found some more, and then someone found a whole bunch of them, and it seems that that's what made the the famous ar the articles all over National Geographic, archaeology, uh previews and all that, the papers, and uh, folks really latched onto it, I guess, because they were so birdy. Some people dedicated their whole lives to um, understanding the hand axe, but I think they didn't, because the hand axe, or the stone that could be made into a hand axe, is just a byproduct of a lithic technology that is much older than folks are letting it be known. Uh, the same thing happened with cleavers. Someone uh, found a cleaver and then spent the rest of their academic career <laughs> studying cleavers. And I'm not running that down or nothing, but the same cleavers that I find on this hill could have been called the Ogwa that Africa place. Anyway, that they found those kind of tools. So of course these silly these people were not smart enough to know that there's I don't know. I don't know how to say this, but I've seen some of the silliest articles about hand axes. Uh, they call them the Boy Scout pocket knife of the ancient people. Well, um, I do not think you could run a village or a TP or a family with one type of tool. There's many types of tool to make a good family life. Abrasion tools, small cutting tools, they had to have traps to catch fish, animals, they had to dig up roots and all that to give them the proper diet so a hand axe can't be the carry-all for all tools. 
So, let me pause for a minute. I think I need new thoughts and a Diet Coke. When these divots are made and the sanding is done, it will leave part of that divot on each side of the stone that was split. Not half of it, of course, because there was sanding in the middle, but a portion enough to see that the stone was split in that manner. And that sort of proves it to me, but the added proof I would like to have is to dig around in those boxes where archaeologists have already dated things. It's 50,000, 100,000, or whatever. And I would look for this split stone process. And um, that's all I have to say about that. Bye for now.